नमो विष्णुपदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमाते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वते देव गौरवाणी प्रचारिने निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात दिशतारिने चैतन्य प्रभो नित्यानंद श्रीअद्वैत गदाधिगोर्भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Nittai Gaur Hari Bo Hari Bo Hari Bo Hari Bo Jaya Jaya Prabhu Pad Prabhu Prabhu Pad, Prabhu Pad. Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bo. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale. Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sharashate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunnavadi Paschata Deshatarine Bancha Kalpatarubhascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanang Pavanebhyo Vaishna Vibhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shibhashadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna. First of all, I want to ex express my gratitude to the organizers of this program to give me this opportunity to be here and speak about Srila Prabhupada and is gone on this very special occasion of ISKCON 50. We are inaugurating the 50th anniversary of three very special occasions. Srila Prabhupada's departure from Calcutta for the USA, Srila Prabhupada's arrival in USA, and also it is going to lead to Srila Prabhupada's establishing ISKCON in America. 
on 13th August 1965, Srila Prabhupada left Calcutta for America. On 17th September, after 35 days of travel, in a cargo ship, Srila Prabhupada arrived in America, in Boston. And then, Srila Prabhupada established an institution within just a few months after his arrival in America. He started this movement in a small little storefront in the Lower East Side of New York. 26 Second Avenue and he named the institution the International Society International Society small little storefront starting it there but he named it the International Society the lawyer who was registering the institution did not mind that international part so much but he had problem or rather he expressed his concern about Krishna consciousness with all good intention he suggested to Srila Prabhupada rather call it the International Society for God Consciousness and the few American followers who were also there with Srila Prabhupada, they also agreed with that proposal. Rather call it the International Society for God Consciousness. But Srila Prabhupada's response was, no. People speak about God, but they do not know who God is. I have come here to make them understand that Krishna is God. So we can see how Srila Prabhupada's mission was so well thought out even at that time. So that is how it all started in a small little storefront that is 26 Second Avenue, Srila Prabhupada established this mission that was designed to establish Krishna consciousness in this world. Srila Prabhupada was actually instructed by his spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, in 1922, during their first meeting in Calcutta, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur just told him straight away, you are an intelligent young man, educated young man, why don't you spread Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings in the Western world through English language? At that time, Srila Prabhupada was a 26-year-old young man, married, had a child, very well situated, a manager in one of the first pharmaceutical companies in India. And Srila Prabhupada quit his job. The owner of that company was Srila Prabhupada's father's friend and he was quite concerned when Srila Prabhupada submitted his resignation and he asked, why are you resigning? And Srila Prabhupada told him that he met, he met a very 
wonderful spiritual personality. He met a sadhu. And this is what he instructed him. So Dr. Bose, who was pro the proprietor of Dr. Bose's laboratory, he suggested why then you have to sub resign. You can ca carry on with that instruction. You don't have to resign from your job. And Prabhupada's response was that when I am employed by you and you are paying me, my time is sold out to you. And I won't have the time to fulfill this mission. So he asked him, what do you want to do then? <laughs> what do you want to do? And Prabhupada's response was that I will start a business and then my time will be my time and I can do whatever I want. So they, at that time, Dr. Bosch actually suggested that, that he takes up the sole selling agency of his products for North India. And that is when Srila Prabhupada moved from Calcutta to Allahabad. And he set up his business there. I had the good fortune of hearing from Srila Prabhupada himself about this, uh, uh, this narration, this anecdote. Srila Prabhupada was speaking to one of his old acquaintances from Calcutta, a very prominent person who was a very well-known Ayurvedic doctor who came to treat Srila Prabhupada in Mayapur in 1977. And Prabhupada was telling him that at that time Prabhupada thought that by running a business he will make money and he will come to, he'll come to the West and fulfill that instruction of, his, of this great saintly personality whom he met. But Prabhupada told him that he was not successful in business. And so that purpose in that way was not, did not happen, was not solved. And <clears throat> Prabhupada also, one Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, his spiritual master, asked him, uh, why, how was his business doing? And Prabhupada's response was, his business was not doing very well. And he said, uh, that is understandable. Because you don't love money enough. That's why you are not successful in business. In order to be successful in business, you have to love money. And <clears throat> anyway, Srila Prabhupada, since that time, since 1922, was endeavoring to come to the West and uh, spread Krishna consciousness. And it took him 43 years to get an opportunity to start that mission. All this while Prabhupada was struggling. Prabhupada was prepared to go anywhere out of India. When some opportunity came to go to Japan, Prabhupada was trying to take up that opportunity. But we can well imagine by going to Japan, you know, he couldn't have really achieved very much. And then Prabhupada mentioned to this person, Dr. Bimalananda, Bimalananda Tarka Tirtha, that finally when Krishna sent him 
Krishna sent him as a pauper. But Krishna made all the arrangements. Srila Prabhupada, as you all know, he came to America. He didn't fly to America. He did not even come to America in a passenger ship. He came in a cargo ship. The ship that carries goods from one port to another. But Prabhupada was prepared to take that opportunity to come to the West. He met Sumati Morarji, the owner of Sindhya Steamship Company, a very nice lady. And Prabhupada used to go to her and Prabhupada just got to know her during his visits, visits to Kurukshetra. Prabhupada actually met Sumati Morarji for the first time in Kurukshetra. That is how the acquaintances was established. She was originally situated in Bombay, that's where her head office was. She went to Kurukshetra on a kind of a pilgrimage. And she's a very pious lady belonging to Ballav Sampradaya. And, and Prabhupada requested her that you have so many ships going to America, please I'll make some arrangement, please allow me to go to America in one of the ships. So what Maharaj told, my ships don't carry passengers, my ships carry goods. It's a cargo ship. Prabhupada said, it doesn't matter, but it goes to America, so just let me go in one of the ships. Then she tried to persuade Srila Prabhupada. She was completely against that idea of Srila Prabhupada going to America in the cargo ship. She, at that time Prabhupada was 69 years old. And she, uh, I had the good fortune of meeting Sumati Morarji also a few times. Her house was quite close to our temple in Bombay, Juhu temple. Very nice lady and she she loved to talk about Srila Prabhupada. And she said, Swamiji, what will you do there? Who is going to listen to you? <coughs> America is not, you know, people there are not so spiritually inclined. And what will you eat there? Uh, no, there is no vegetable. They all, they all eat meat. And the weather is so severe. And it, it's such an expensive place. What will you do there? But Srila Prabhupada was adamant. Please, just let me go. My Guru Maharaj wanted me to do that. And this is the last time I can possibly do something about it. At the very end, at the fag end of my life, I just want to give it a chance, give it a try. All my life, since I met him, I had been trying to go to the West. It didn't happen. Now please, I am requesting you to please make that arrangement. Then finally Sumati Morarji arranged for Srila Prabhupada to go to America. And she was quite convinced that Srila Prabhupada won't succeed. While she gave her the ticket for Srila Prabhupada, or made arrangement for Srila Prabhupada to go to America, she also made an arrangement for Prabhupada to return whenever she wanted. Just in case, when she gave a very clear instruction to her office in New York that whenever Swamiji wants to go back to India, please let him take the next ship. And in this way, Srila Prabhupada arrived and as you all know, uh, Prabhupada had two heart attacks in the ship. Prabhupada celebrated his 70th birthday in the ship. It happened in Janmashtami, was, Prabhupada celebrated Janmashtami in the ship. And <clears throat> he had two heart attacks. He didn't know at that time that he had a heart attack, only later on. Uh, he realized what actually happened to him. 
But Krishna took care of him. Mr. Arun Pandya, the captain of the ship, mentioned or told Srila Prabhupada, in his entire career, he never seen Atlantic to be so peaceful. Uh, as if, and Prabhupada also had a dream uh, that Krishna was, uh, I think Prabhupada's dream was that ten incarnations, thus avatars were rowing the boat <laughs> across the ocean. And this is how Srila Prabhupada came in his own words. When he came to New York, he didn't know whether to turn to right or to left. He didn't know where to go. He didn't even know where he was going to stay. The only acquaintance that he had was the person who sponsored his visa. Never met him. Just happened to be the son of one of his acquaintances from Mathura. Gopal Agrawal. He was in America, working in America, got married to an American lady. So Prabhupada, he was the only acquaintance, only contact Srila Prabhupada had. So Prabhupada wrote to him as he was boarding the uh, ship. So there was no, no possibility of even receiving any reply. <laughs> in that way Srila Prabhupada just uh, came to New York. Fortunately, Gopal Agarwal uh, sent one travel agency to receive Srila Prabhupada, an agent, a travel agent to receive Srila Prabhupada. And fortunately that person came and put him in a bus to Butler, Pennsylvania, a small little town. So Prabhupada went there. Gopal Agarwal made arrangement for Prabhupada to stay in the uh, YMCA. A very simple uh, arrangement for accommodation. Stayed in Butler, Pennsylvania for a short while. And then he also developed one acquaintance with one Dr. Mishra in New York. And that's how he came to New York. And this is how uh, it started. And Prabhupada, initially we know how great was his struggle. Fortunately, he had some books that he printed. All he carried is three box load of books. Uh, three volume, three, uh, first canto printed in three volumes. Uh, he just carried them with him. And initially he was selling the books and with the money he was maintaining himself. Stayed with Dr. Mishra for a few days and then he found one uh, accommodation, rented it, but he moved out of it. Then he uh, moved in with one of the acquaintances, young acquaintances, a boy called David Allen by Prabhupada's coming in Prabhupada's contact, these young boys became attracted to him. They gave up their bad habits. Uh, David Allen gave, he was uh, taking LSD like many other boys of that time. But he gave up. Prabhupada wrote about him that probably David Allen would be his first American disciple. But unfortunately, David Allen went back to his bad habits again and he started to take LSD. And he started to have disagreement with Srila Prabhupada. One day he attacked Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada ran out of the house, climbed down the stairs, came to the road. Again a destitute, didn't have any place to go, stay. <clears throat> He called up one of his early acquaintances at that time, one young man, Michael Grant, told him what happened. They were all from the same group, David Allen, Michael Grant. 
Prabhupada made their acquaintances in Dr. Mishra's place. So <clears throat> he arranged, he himself, Michael Grant himself could not make arrangement for Srila Prabhupada to stay in his place. But he arranged that Prabhupada could stay with one of his friends. And while Prabhupada was staying there, he made the arrangement for 26 Second Avenue and a little store, little apartment behind that storefront. And that Mark, Michael, Michael Grant actually eventually became Mukunda Goswami. He played a very, very significant role in Srila Prabhupada's uh, establishing ISKCON in America. He is the one who got this 26 Second Avenue. Then Prabhupada instructed him to go to San Francisco. So he went to San Francisco and set it up in San Francisco. Then he, along with his friends, two other friends, Gurudas Prabhu and Shamsundar Prabhu and their wives, Malati Mataji, Jamana Mataji and Janaki, Mukunda Maharaj's ex-wife. Six of them went to London. There also, they didn't have any place to stay. What to speak of space, place to stay, the way they went was also quite amazing. Uh, they flew in to Amsterdam because the flights in Am to Amsterdam was cheaper. There were some cheap flights operating and uh, like uh, Icelandic Air, I don't know which one they took, but these were the cheap airlines that used to fly uh, and Lux, and Lux Air. So, <clears throat> and they thought that they would go to Amsterdam and go across the channel to London. But when they went there, they found that in order to enter into UK, they have to show a certain amount of money. They didn't have that kind of money for all six of them to go. So they put all their money together. One couple went. Then they wired the money back to Amsterdam for the second couple to go. <laughs> so in this way, uh, six of them went to London. Initially they thought that they would uh, when they go to London, they'll be able to preach the message of Swamiji. Although they were staying with some generous Indian's house, but even they were not interested in this message. It was a big struggle for them. Then one day they saw the pictures of the Beatles dressed in Indian clothes. And they thought that probably Beatles will be good uh, prospective candidates for this message. But those days, the Beatles were the most important people in this world. Uh, to meet them was not easy. So, then one day, Shamsundar Prabhu bumped into one of his acquaintances who was the manager of a very famous rock group of the time, the Grateful Dead. Uh, rock Scully. So he met him and Rock Scully told him that he came to London to meet the Beatles. They had to do, he had to do something with the Beatles. So he asked them whether he could introduce them to the Beatles, introduce him to the Beatles. So he said, yeah, come to the Apple studio on such and such day. So Shamsundar Prabhu went, but the guard wouldn't let him in because he didn't have any appointment. And while he was trying to convince the guard, just talking to him, at that time, John Lennon's Japanese wife, Yoko Ono, just drives in with her in her white Rolls Royce. And seeing him dressed in that way, dhoti and kurta, she said, you must be a friend of John. <laughs> and he said, yes, yes. So she said, come on in. So that is how 
they he had the entry to the apple studio and then while he was waiting in the reception area waiting for rock scally to come george harrison just happened to pass by and seeing him he exclaimed where you where you guys been all this while i saw you in san francisco and since then i have been thinking of meeting you <laughs> the point i am trying to make is like are these all just coincidences just chance happenings no this is wonderfully designed by shri chaitanya mahaprabhu Prabhupada's appearance in the West is not just a chance happening. Whatever happened through Śrīla Prabhupāda is not just a chance happening. It is the divine arrangement of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Chaitanya Mahāprabhu came to distribute something that he never gave be, given before. Anārpita chorin chirāt. Anarpito means not given. Arpan means to give. And on arpito means not given. During a long time. How long? 4.32 billion years. In the previous day of Brahma, it was given. Krishna comes only once in a day of Brahma. to reveal his braja leela and then in the following kali yuga krishna comes as chaitanya mahaprabhu and <clears throat> he distributes braja prem namo mahavadannaya as rupa goswami identified shri chaitanya mahaprabhu namo mahavadannaya krishna prema pradayate this krishna prem braja prem is extremely rare is the topmost asset of the spiritual sky and in order to distribute that krishna came in order to reveal that krishna prem braja prem and then chaita and he came as chaitanya mahaprabhu to distribute it the most rare object chaitanya mahaprabhu distributed but he did it only throughout india but he predicted that it would spread all over the world in every town and village now can the words of the supreme personality of god had ever go in vain Uh, his words can never go in vain when he predicted when he said it it's bound to happen and this fulfillment of that prediction was through three personality gradually this development is very interesting actually after chaitanya mahaprabhu's disappearance his teachings and his dham disappeared his teaching was completely eclipsed by the upper sampradayas and his dham navadeep mayapur uh, disappeared after a massive flood but then the revival started through shila bhakti vinod thakur when chaitanya mahaprabhu's teachings were completely lost when in whole of bengal bhakti vinod thakur could not find a single volume of chaitanya charitamrita in entire bengal he was searching for chaitanya charitamrita but finally he found it in orissa and he took that chaitanya charitamrita and started to print it with his amrita prabaho bhashya the nectarian flow of commentary and this is how bhakti vinod thakur started the revival of shri chaitanya mahaprabhu's teachings
And he also discovered Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's birthplace, Mayapur. Bhakti Vinod Thakur had, the full, had full conviction that Mahaprabhu's words is going to become a reality. So much so that in, 19, in 1892, he wrote uh, two small books, Life and Precepts of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Bhagavad. And these two books he distributed to all the major universities in the world. <clears throat> and in that he mentioned that how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings will spread all over the world in every town and village. We can see what a conviction. Like when India was a British colony, when Indian culture was not at all recognized, when whatever Indian was considered to be uh, mere fairy tales or uh, useless uh, stories, the teachings of the Vedas. And when the Indians also used to think that West is the best. Uh, at that time, Bhakti Vinod Thakur made that, uh, he wrote uh, with that conviction. Mahaprabhu's teachings will spread all over the world in every town and village. And then came his uh, illustrious son, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. He took that message of Bhakti Vinod Thakur and gave it a shape in the form of an institution, Gauriyamat and spread the movement very effectively all over the world, all over India. And his goal was, his objective was to spread this to the Western world. And that's why we see at the very first meeting, he tells Srila Prabhupada, take this message and distribute it all over the world. And then uh, Srila Prabhupada came. So these three personalities are the divine arrangement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, and Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada knew that in his lifetime he won't be able to accomplish the mission of spreading it all over the world in every town and village. He did it all over the world, but every town and village was yet to be accomplished. So what is the fourth consideration? Uh, after these three, the fourth consideration is ISKCON. Prabhupada knew that he won't be able to accomplish it and it will probably take generations, it will take a long, long time uh, to spread it effectively to every town and village. And that's why he created the institution so that his mission will continue even after his disappearance. Just as his spiritual master established the mission, Gauriyamat. But unfortunately, that institution fell apart because of his leading disciples couldn't understand the importance of the instruction that he gave them. His instruction was collectively manage the institution and spread the movement. But their consideration was how can a spiritual organization be run by a group of managers? A spiritual institution needs a spiritual head and they appointed a spiritual head disregarding their spiritual master's instruction. And unfortunately, when that personality fell down, the structure collapsed. And Srila Prabhupada told us emphatically, don't make the same mistake that my God brothers made after Guru Maharaj's disappearance. He asked them to collectively manage the society through the governing body, a governing body, but they did not do that. And as a result of that, the mission was lost. 
Therefore, Srila Prabhupada had to build another institution, the ISKCON. And to hold the institution together, Srila Prabhupada trained his leading disciples uh, to create this governing body that would collectively manage the society, manage the institution. That is one aspect of the institution. And the other aspect of the institution is Srila Prabhupada's position as the founder Acharya. And these two factors are of most important consideration to keep the institution function effectively, fulfilling its purpose. Fortunately, by Krishna's mercy, ISKCON is not only to gather 38 after, years after Srila Prabhupada's disappearance, this movement is spreading so effectively because of the institution is still intact. In Goryamat, all the sannasis continued without falling down, most of them. So far I remember one or two, only two persons had spiritual difficulties, but everyone continued. They continued preaching, continued in their temples, continued to uh, make devotees, initiate them, train them, but preaching stopped. On the other hand, when we see ISKCON, in ISKCON, uh, I don't know the exact number of how many gurus and sannasis have fallen down, but ISKCON is still going strong. Why? Because of the institution, ISKCON. So that is the most important thing that we have to consider and effectively support so that the mission continues. Anyway, I will stop now. Many other speakers are also there. We'll, have, we'll be hearing. So today we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of uh, ISKCON. Are, which is preparing for the 50th anniversary, which is going to take place next year, 2016. Uh, and this is the beginning. We have good seven, eight months to prepare ourselves for, for the grand celebration of the 50th birthday uh, of ISKCON. So if there is any question or comment, Please, we have a few minutes as Nityananda Prabhu suggested. Maharaj, I wanted to ask how you first met Prabhupada and how Prabhupada convinced you to be a devotee. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, if I go back to the point, uh, at the actual meeting, first I met Srila Prabhupada in a dream. My first meeting was in a dream. I was in India, I was in Europe, then I went back to India in search of a guru. And I got totally, dis totally disillusioned not finding anyone to whom I could actually surrender myself after about a year, one year long search. And then eventually I got nectar of devotion. I started to read it. And from the very first page I felt that this is what I was looking for. And then the next night I had a dream of Srila Prabhupada. I saw him sitting on a elaborate seat that looked like a throne because in India the sadhus generally sit on a vasasan. So I saw him sitting in a which looked like sitting on what looked like a throne and there was a brilliant light coming out from him and just that sight made me feel made me realize rather that finally I found my spiritual master. So, 
Then I inquired where Srila Prabhupada was and I got to know that Srila Prabhupada was in America. So I decided to visit the places where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu performed his pastimes. And so the first place I went to Maya, was Mayapur. I arrived there in the evening and I found all the devotees were so welcoming, so inviting. And so the next morning after the Bhagavatam class, the sannyasi who gave me the class, gave the class, he asked, he spoke to me. And when he requested that, why don't I stay there and see how, whether I like it. I was already convinced after reading Nectar of Devotion, it was just a matter of the right time to meet Srila Prabhupada. So when they invited me so in such a way, I felt, yeah, why don't I join? I already made up my mind. So I just went to a barber, shaved my head, <laughs> went to Ganga, <laughs> threw away my old clothes uh, and put on a dhoti and kurta. And so that's how I joined. At that time Prabhupada was in America. Then I met Prabhupada in Kumbha Mela, but I couldn't go close to him. But all of a sudden, one day Prabhupada decided to leave Kumbha Mela and go to, Cal go to Calcutta. And an arrangement was made for Srila Prabhupada to travel in a Calcutta-bound train, where a first-class carriage was hooked onto that train. And Prabhupada, with a small group of devotees were traveling in that. And very fortunately, by the arrangement of Bhavananda Maharaj, I was included in that group. And so, the actual meeting took place in that train. He took me to Srila Prabhupada and introduced me to him. And in that first meeting, Srila Prabhupada gave me the service, he instructed me to translate his books into Bengali. And, and that service actually gave me the opportunity to be close to Srila Prabhupada. Because now I have an excuse that I have to show the translations to Srila Prabhupada. And so that is how uh, like I had a very good fortune of being close to Srila Prabhupada. And then Prabhupada gave me the service to, trans to reply his letters into Bengali. And he had some Bengali letters, so he wanted me to reply. So when I finished the Bengali letters, he gave me a stack of Hindi letters to reply. And then Prabhupada, one day, one afternoon, Prabhupada told me, that he was appointing me as his secretary for Indian affairs. So at that time, Tamal Krishna Maharaj was Prabhupada's secretary. So he called Tamal Krishna Maharaj and told him about that appointment and suggested that I move into his room, which was next to Prabhupada's room. So that gave me another good fortune of being so close to a very, very wonderful devotee and extremely exemplary personality, a devotee like Tamal Krishna Maharaj. And I had the good fortune of sharing the room with him as long as we were serving Srila Prabhupada for about 10 months. Wherever we went, Tamal Krishna Maharaj insisted that I stay uh, in the, with him in the same room. Because in Bombay, <coughs> There was proper secretary's room and the servant's room. So I thought that I would share the room with Upendra Prabhu. But Tamal Krishna Maharaj insisted that, no, I stay in that room where he was staying. So this way I was very fortunate also to receive a lot of affection and mercy of Tamal Krishna, his Divine Grace, Tamal Krishna Maharaj. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Any other question or comment? Any comment, Maharajas? <laughs> okay. Okay, so, <clears throat> so then we can have some kirtan. Huh? Should I?